So, everyone should know who I am, James Willis, just kind of out of uh, doing lecturing correctly, I introduced myself. Uh, this is the first uh, lecture in the education series this year, so for people who haven't seen it before, it's kind of uh, talking about how to make you guys better educators, sometimes better leaders, and just some of these uh, other types of concepts except for uh, medical management and kind of looking at the EBM and critical care. So it's not everyone's cup of tea, but bear with me and hopefully we'll learn a couple of things. So the objectives, number one, we're going to define the stages of group dynamics and uh, how teams kind of uh, form and manage each other, uh, discuss some barriers, pitfalls, and kind of talk about how we can repair those dynamics. So why? Why do you, think, why do you guys think this is important for emergency medicine docs or for us as residents to learn about this? We're in really close space next to each other on top of Good. So the, I think the obvious and easy answer is kind of the clinical area, right? More than any other specialty, I think emergency medicine is a team sport. We work in interdisciplinary teams. We work in teams of residents with nurses, social workers, everything. So you're going to work in a team for the rest of your life. What else? Patients. Good. So patients. And, that's, and let's kind of maybe try to close there in terms of the clinical area. You're going to be working in teams. You're going to be working with many different people in a lot of different ways. Is there anywhere else that you may be doing this? We're doing a lot of consult services. Good. <clears throat> anywhere else? In the educational arena? Like if we go to academia or uh, Yeah, so maybe an administrative team or an educational team. So uh, one big team I'm involved with is the program director team, the educational team. There's one other big one. Sorry? Policy. Policy. Policy, so administrative, I think Andrew said. Personal, you can definitely apply some of this stuff to your personal relationships, your group of friends, your, your significant others. Oh, Dr. Sinner, research teams, right? You, you, you never really, you don't often put out a paper manuscript on your own, you're usually working in a, a, a team of people and kind of, kind of breaking up the work that gets done, who's writing, who's doing a lot of the researching. So hopefully some of you will be doing some research. It probably won't be this kind of bench research, but you'll be... Uh, You'll be working with a, a group of people. And on top of that, you guys may not be necessarily in a lot of these teams, or you'll be part of teams in different ways, but you're most likely to be the leader of all, if not some, of these teams. The clinical team, you will be. You'll be an attendant. You'll be the, the in charge of that inter interdisciplinary team, of that team of clinicians. Um, and hopefully you're here because you want to be leaders in other areas too, either administrative, academically. So another part of this lecture will be how to deal with teams and how to lead teams into getting uh, into a good stage into working together. So this is the phases of group dynamics or team dynamics. This is probably the one thing I really got, want you guys to take away from this lecture. Um, and I was reading about this for a different reason than making this lecture a couple of months ago. And it kind of really fell into the framework of how I've seen a lot of small groups I've worked in, different teams kind of come together, and it kind of helps you realize how this actually happens. So we'll go through each one. So forming is when a group comes together, everyone's polite, everyone's a little anxious, kind of uh, reserved, keeping our personalities um, in check, and the leader is going to be dominant. This is going to be, the leader is going to be taking everyone by the hand and kind of moving us forward and telling us what we need to do. This is kind of when you start as an intern, right? You're kind of keeping to yourself, don't want to rock the boat, and it's kind of orientation time. Storming, which was a good thing to kind of learn about uh, group dynamics, is always should happen in some form. This is when everyone's personalities start to develop and you have to start having conflicts. So working style is going to conflict, you might challenge authority, people might be jockeying for position, and you may start to get overwhelmed with question team works. This is when teams fail. So sometimes a team will get to this storming stage and they won't be able to either uh, get over that barrier or they won't have the tools or have a leader that can get them there. I feel like this is PGY2, maybe PGY3 for EMIMs. This is a tough year. You start kind of getting more efficient, but you start kind of hitting a wall, um, maybe uh, having nursing colleagues who aren't helping you out, and you feel like you can get further, but you're kind of not able to. And a lot of times in the PGY2 year, you start kind of feeling like you're failing in wellness in terms of your, your motivation and moving forward. Norming, so this is when people start resolving differences, you start appreciating strengths, respecting authority. This is when you start kind of getting over that hump. This is PGY3, hopefully. 
The interesting thing about storming and norming is that a lot of groups go back and forth. So you may start norming and start uh, accomplishing, but when you uh, have a new task or a new team member or a new barrier, you may fall back into that storming stage. And then performing is where everybody wants to get. This is when you start getting to that pinnacle of teamwork where everything is just easy, you get a new task, you figure out, you know who's going to take care of it, you know what's going to happen, you know everybody's roles, everyone's personalities. And hopefully at this point the leaders can just step back and delegate the work. And hopefully this is when you're PG by four. Uh, last stage I was added, kind of later in the theory of this uh, uh, group dynamic stages, is adjourning. And it's just the idea that some groups are going to have new members, lose members. Some groups are going to uh, disband at some point. And this hopefully will be graduation as well. It's a big celebration. So <coughs> everyone should have experience with this in some ways, as a kind of evidence that it's similar to your passage through residency. What can cause poor dynamics? Communication. Good. Communication. Never addressing conflict. Good. <clears throat> Poor resources. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Poor resources. Resources. Malignant personalities. Good. That sounded a little personal. <laughs> <laughs> So if somebody uh, doesn't want to be involved or doesn't, doesn't get involved, you can have free riding, similar thing. And then evaluation apprehension is one that I figured that no one would say. I, I see this a lot in medical students, small groups. You're not going to contribute, you're not going to get involved because if I don't say anything or I don't do anything, then I can't be evaluated. And I think we've all probably been there in medical school. So if you think about this in CCT, if you think about it, if you have a bad CCT shift uh, where the breakdown happens, if you have... Uh, maybe that attending or a senior resident who's not a, not a good leader, not managing a team well, that's going to go bad. If you have a junior resident uh, who's not, not getting involved, not, not uh, pushing the machine forward or free riding, you can see how this can fall apart. I think CCT is a major place where we really work as a team, whereas in other places we're kind of taking care of the patient as an individual within the confines of what we're doing. And then you can always have the blockers, the specific people on the team who are going to uh, cause problems, and we brought this up as well. So um, you can have an aggressor, someone who wants the, what they want more than anything and doesn't care about the uh, final goals, a negator, withdrawer, someone who's looking for recognition, and then the, the classic kind of class clown or joker in the group as well. So. What we're going to talk about now is kind of some strategies as being a group member to, uh, to figure out how you can repair dynamics or move the team forward to that performing or norming stage. Anyone think of anything we can do? Address conflict when it comes up. Okay. Somebody need to find roles and responsibility. Good. Identifying what the blockages are. Okay. Good. All right, let's go into it more. So I think some of what you guys are saying is kind of what you would do as the leader, and we'll talk more about that, which is great. I think that's the group that we uh, work in here. Um, a good, one good thing is know your team. Kind of know uh, one thing hopefully you'll learn from this, know the phase that you're in. Sometimes that helps to kind of figure out what, what you have to do or where you have to go from there. Uh, knowing the roles, so hopefully this helps you guys kind of realize maybe what your role in the team is, what the other person is kind of identifying as, and work from there. Tackle problems quickly, you guys said that. Uh, break down barriers, focus on communication, and pay attention to what's going on. I think one of the biggest things I've seen happen is that just no one's paying attention. Everyone, we're all, uh, especially in the medical field, kind of type A people, we're going to do what we have to do, but not paying attention to what overall is happening. 
All right, so this is where the survey comes in that most of you kind of mentioned. So just wanted to give you an idea of uh, different styles of conflict, conflict resolution and hopefully give you a little bit of perspective of how you will handle conflict. <coughs> I was going to give you guys maybe five minutes if you haven't done it. It sounds like a bunch of people have, but I understand if anyone has it. Does anyone want to do it? I only have the scoring sheet, so you have to pull it up from your phone if you want to do the rest of it. While people are doing, does anyone want to, I've heard a couple of people already say, anyone want to share what, what they got or any surprises or, this is the, this is kind of the score, but it's kind of obvious, the more, the more you got in one, the more likely you're, use that kind of conflict resolution. I feel it's probably about the same answer, would be like two or three questions. <laughs> yeah, one part of it is hopefully that you're going to reflect on it a little bit. Um, to kind of, I think we all kind of inherently know how we deal with conflict, but maybe sometimes we don't realize it. I'm definitely, I, I got accommodating and comp compromising, which I kind of know about myself. And I was just saying to Andrew too, I think it, um, it can be different depending <coughs> on what aspect of your life you were thinking about it. You may be very different how you resolve conflict in your relationships at home or with your friends versus uh, maybe how you deal with consultants. And if not, you can just see where most of your answers are kind of popping up. So if you look at the scale, pretty much if you're over kind of eight or nine in anyone's, any one area, that's probably where your conflict resolution style is going to be. But obviously it can be mixed. This is kind of the general framework 
of where these conflict resolution styles come from. As you go across the x-axis, you get more cooperative. As you go off the y-axis, you get more assertive. And compromising is kind of in the middle. So competing, if you found yourself here, you're worried about your own concerns, you're power oriented. I thought of this as kind of like the gunner in medical school. Accommodating, you may neglect your own concerns. You're selfless, obeying, you're bending over backwards to kind of make sure everybody else gets what they want, everybody um, is happy. Avoiding, you just get the hell out of there, you don't want to worry about the conflict, you don't want to see conflict, you don't want to think that it's there. Postpone it, withdraw from it. Collaborating, I thought was interesting. Collaborating sounds like a great term, a great kind of, uh, if you were collaborating, that would be good. So you're going to dig in, find a solution, meeting all concerns, and you're going to explore disagreement. The interesting thing about collaborating is that compared to compromising. So it seems like what collaborating is, is that you're trying to uh, make sure everyone's goals are met. And that you're working very hard at that. The idea is that it might take time to do that. Whereas if you're more compromising, this is going to be an expedient and more intermediate situation. Where no one's going to be completely happy but everyone's going to kind of get a little ground. So, I guess reflect on that first 20 seconds about uh, where you fall. And I think what you can do with that information is either first just realize how you fit into these groups and who you're going to be, um, how the other people are reacting and how, they're, and how, how what their goals are. I think you probably can change it. You can probably be different ways in different situations. I kind of mentioned that I think um, probably maybe at home versus at work, or maybe in different work, work groups or diff, work, act differently. I think when I'm working with a consultant, I'm probably a little more competing than I usually am uh, in general, because I want my goals. I think I'm a little less apt to kind of collaborate or be compromising if I think I'm right and if I think this is what I, need, what I need to get done for the patient. And that may be what you need to do to worry about the patient's perspectives. Any questions about that specifically, or kind of being within the group? Because we're going to transition now to uh, talking about maybe some leadership techniques or the leadership role. Okay. So as I mentioned, I think most of you guys are going to be probably a leader of a group, definitely in the clinical area, probably in other work groups, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So kind of what you'd have to do as a leader is first identify the roles in the group, identify what stage uh, the group is in, and you have to manage it uh, from there. Define the roles, so we kind of, I think uh, Ronnie mentioned this before, your group, you should be telling people what their goal is, what their objective is, and how they're supposed to work together. A good thing to do in the beginning of a group, when a group is forming, is to kind of come up with a team charter, to specifically say what the objectives are, what the mission statement is, and uh, what the rules and regulations are. This is what we try to do in orientation with you guys when we have that uh, handbook session. Kind of tell you where, what we're about, where we want to go, where we want you to go, and what the rules are. You have to encourage and sometimes reprimand. You have to make sure everyone stays in line. And then you have to have regular reviews, especially in those times uh, in storming, I think even in norming, you have to check in and make sure that the group is doing well. So this is kind of the same thing, it's just written out. All right, so we, I think we probably talked about this a little bit, but if you identify your group, your team is in the forming stage, what do you think you should be doing as a leader? Designating roles and responsibilities. Good. Getting introductions, figuring out who's who. Good. So you're going to be probably a very strong person this time. You're going to be kind of directing what's going on, roles, responsibilities establish clear objectives for the individuals as well as the whole. Storming, so this is probably a very critical time. What things can a leader do? We've set some of them here. Reprimand. Reprimand, you might have to, yeah. Get people back on objective. Maintain the storming in a functional way. Good. What did you say here? Like help facilitate the storming to be functional, like make sure that the issues that are coming up are in a safe environment to be addressed. Yeah, just simply addressing. 
So sometimes that just doesn't happen. They'll work it out. Can you identify the root cause of the conflict? Good. Work towards solutions, not uh, just you know, conflict. Good. Can you give a sense of humor? That can be important. I will say if someone in conflict to what I just said, knowing when to step back, like you can't fix the problems for the group where this isn't a time to like direct and solve, say you do this, you do this, the group has to has to kind of bang their heads a little bit to figure it out, otherwise it's just gonna be a quick fix. So yeah, so talking about process and structure, bringing them, facilitating uh, the process and kind of bringing them into a sort of structure, helping them build relationships and trust. And that's uh, and building relationships with trust with them as well. <coughs> and this idea of positive and firm. So you should be positive, you should be encouraging, but at the same time kind of, I think one of you, Brian, said to be firm and to reprimand and make sure that it doesn't go too far off the rails. Explain the stages. I think this is an interesting idea. Talking to the group about saying, hey, you're in the storming stage right now. This needs to happen. It's going to get better. Rather than having people um, get upset and say they, they just don't want to be over with this and don't want to be in the group anymore. Coaching, and then you can do some psychometric indicators. They do a lot of this stuff, I think, in the business world. Um, helping people understand what their personality is, what their conflict resolution style is, and that can maybe help people uh, move past it. Norming, so this is hopefully when you can step back. Maybe you can throw in a team building event to kind of help people further get along this stage. And then performing, uh, ideally, as a leader, you should just be able to delegate. The group should be moving like a well-formed machine, and you should be able to just give them a task and step away from it. And then a journey, kind of what we've mentioned, is just you know, celebrate achievements and hopefully help transition to the next stages. So just a little bit about group roles. As a leader, you should, probably, you should be responsible about identifying these roles and kind of uh, making sure that uh, they're being fulfilled or that there are dysfunctional roles that uh, you want to get rid of. So you want to determine in your group what the most helpful or needed roles are, recruit the missing roles, ID dysfunctional roles, and then again, reevaluate this regularly because people can change how they're acting in the group and where they are in the group. These are some of the just basic task roles that were some of the research I have, but the way I think about this is kind of the trauma code and uh, what we do for that. You need the person doing airway, you need the person doing procedure left, you need the person putting IVs, and you need the nurse to do the uh, uh, vital signs and, or some of the run and get blood. So figure out what the tasks that you need to get done and uh, assign or find people who are good at those things. And the personal roles are more kind of what that person brings to that role. Are they the energetic, friendly, energized person? Are they a person that's going to harmonize and kind of compromise people? So as a leader, you should look at who these people are. If you're interviewing people to hire them, you can kind of figure out how they're going to fit into the group. And maybe it's a role that you need. Maybe there's too much conflict and you need that, you need that harmonizer. Or maybe there's um, a lull and you need someone to get in there and energize the group. And then again, the dysfunctional roles are kind of similar to what we talked about before. Really the big thing is to identify, hopefully, these people before you bring them into the group. They kind of get an idea maybe about uh, past failures or their personality. Or identify them and get rid of them when they are in your team or your group. <coughs> or reprimand them and get them back on task. So there's one more kind of uh, activity for you guys to do. This is the Fiedler Least Preferred Coworkers Scale. Uh, when I kind of explained, I was practicing this last night with my wife, when I kind of explained to her, it got a little confusing, so just bear with me. So this is the scale. I want you guys to think of your least preferred coworker and choose where they, where they are. So pleasant and unpleasant. My least preferred coworker, I would probably want them, they would be more unpleasant. So you're picking what you want the least preferred person. So look at this for maybe like five minutes. If you want to write on the same paper, just kind of your numbers as you go down. And remember, it's not, it's not as easy as saying your least preferred coworker is going to be ones all the way down. Um, cheerful, my least preferred coworker may not be super gloomy, but I may not be my, want them, my most preferred coworker, to be super cheap, cheerful either. I probably want them somewhere in between. So think about that as well. They're not all very clear cut. So this is 
theoretical. You, you can, if you have a real person, you can imagine them too. That might be helpful. It can be a real person. <laughs> So these are generally what your results fall into. So if your added up scores are less than 56, you're identified as more of a task-oriented leader. 56 to 63, I guess you're in the middle ground, you, you get nothing. And over 63, you're more relationship-oriented. So the way it works out, if you do the quick math, if you, if you were probably in the th averaging three or four range in this scale, you're more relationship-oriented. But if you were down below three, the ones and twos and everything, you're more task oriented. So what does this mean? So if you're task oriented, you're negatively viewing uh, your least preferred coworker, obviously. Uh, you're quick to organize, and you want to complete tasks. I was guessing this is probably most of us, as ED does. Relationship oriented, you're more po you have a more positive view of the least preferred coworker. You're more ideal for managing and avoiding conflict and working within complex decisions. So within this kind of scale, and this is all a little bit kind of like so sociological mumbo jumbo, but um, to figure out what task you're best at for as these type of leaders, you want to look at three different things. One is the leader member relationship. So is there a good relationship between the leader of the group and uh, the team, the members. The task structure, so are you working on a clear task-oriented task or is it a more complex, a vague situation? And what's the leader's power? Is it absolute? Is it somebody that can um, fire you, hire you? Or is it someone that kind of has more ambiguous and less power? And Fiddler kind of broke it down like this. So we'll go through one and each one. So, so if there's good member-leader relations, 
It's a very structured task and the leader's power is strong. You want a task-oriented person. So mm -hmm. someone who's just going to go and get the job done. Rather, if uh, the, structure, the task is more unstructured, weaker power, you might have want a more relationship-oriented person. So someone who's going to go in there and uh, kind of work on conflict and kind of work within the group a little bit more. Within this kind of thought process, uh, Fielder said that leaders are either one or the other, that you have to pick the right leader for that. Uh, but I think it's probably a little more ambiguous than that. So where can you take this? I think it's a good idea to kind of maybe figure out what your leadership style is when you move forward and be a leader. Figure out maybe what kind of task you're best for uh, because you're probably dooming your team if you're going to go in and be the wrong type of leader for what you're, what you're doing. Or change your leadership style and uh, change what you're doing uh, based on the different tasks of the different groups. And I'm sorry, I know that got a little confusing. So I'm going to wrap up. So learning points, kind of knowing what the stages of group dynamics are. So you kind of figure out where the group is, how you can move forward on that. And that some of the storming is uh, normal stuff. Identify the roles and personalities in your group. You can uh, help you manage them as a leader or as a group member. And just remember that leadership is important and kind of knowing these things and working and facilitating group can help you uh, get them to that performance stage. That's it. Thank you. Any, any questions or comments? Just a quick question. Like in a season, we don't really have time to like storm. So is there, is there a way to kind of try to prevent this before you can? I mean, I know there's some aspect that's necessary for storming, but like is there a way to kind of try to work around that so you can get the performance quicker? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, a CCT shift, uh, I guess I would disagree with you a little bit, there probably is some time to storm. When you're taking care of that one critical patient, probably not, that's the task. Right. But then during the shift, there may be, like, I'm sure you've had some uh, bad feelings towards an attending or a junior resident, kind of like, oh, how long are they doing that? Or, or so, kind of identifying that situation and, and working within that, well, maybe this is their style, or maybe I have to direct them a different way and thinking about that. So, most some CCT shifts are here with maybe Dr. Gore, you're probably doing stuff the whole time. But most CCT shifts, there are lulls, and there's kind of like, well, why the hell didn't that patient get that splint yet, or something like that. So, kind of figuring out where, where to go from there. So, using some of these tools might be helpful for that. And you're also going to be working with the same people over and over again in those situations, too. So, that one shift didn't go well, so how can we kind of change that? Anything else? All right, thank you guys.